Clearly this was an episode for Republicans, because you have to get through an awful lot of bad science and ignore the true science to get through it. And at the heart of it, there's an abortion debate. If British screenwriters knew anything, anything at all about how the space shuttle operates, I would not be here today talking to you about this episode. I'll explain that in the extras. But first, it's Doctor Who Series 8, Episode 7, Kill the Moon, written by Peter Harness, directed by Paul Wilmshurst. Now, if you can get past the pig ignorance about physics, biology, rocket science, polling, and American constitutional law, what we have here is a pretty terrific episode. If, by terrific episode, you mean a lot of that breathing in a spacesuit effect we came to love in 2001, A Space Odyssey, And a lot of creeping around in the dark with lens flares, always good. And spiders the size of badgers scurrying around waiting to leap out at you and cocoon you and eat you. <laughs> and life on Earth in the balance. And our cast in deadly peril with a generous corpse count. And the yo-yo, the doctor being as alien and as alienating as inhumanly possible. And an impossible ethical decision to make. And... No eyebrow jokes. Well, if that's what you mean by a terrific episode, then this was one terrific episode. Very creepy, very scary, very thought-provoking. Also funny, charming, high drama, good character conflict. The challenging ethical choice at the center, are you justified to take an innocent life to save billions of people in peril? Should you take that life when the threat is not certain, but just kind of maybe probable? Maybe there is no threat at all. You don't know, and you have to act or not act. Peter Capaldi, as irascible and curmudgeonly as we could ever want, also charming and amusing in his use of the yo-yo, he earned his keep. Jenna Coleman, as Clara, gets to tell him off as brazenly as any companion has ever told off any doctor. She even swears at him. She bloody well does. I'm pretty sure that if Donna Noble had any memory left of her time with the doctor, she'd be smiling at that. Samuel Anderson as Danny Pink got another chance in a very brief scene to be the most wonderful boyfriend ever. Ellis George is back as Courtney Woods, the young student who was labeled a disruptive influence in last week's episode and is written as a sullen cliché in this week's. Lundvik, the astronaut commander, is played by Hermione Norris, who brings a terrific urgency and presence to the role. Very solid performance. All of this to the good. To the not-so-good. Clara sets a fine example for the kiddies by unwinding from her terrible, horrible, no-good, very bad day by pouring herself a drink, drinking alone in her flat. What an ending. I'm Clara. I need a drink. Confession? I'm drinking alone in my office as I write this. Well, I'm not alone. You're out there. L'chaim. Okay, elephant in the room. Do we want to talk about the bad science or have we just decided we're just meant to ignore that and it doesn't really matter? Because if it matters, there was more bad science in this episode than any episode I can remember offhand. I think the whole point of this episode was to infuriate while it entertained. Spoilers ahead. The space shuttle orbiter gliding in for a landing on the moon, which has no atmosphere. Sorry, wrong. The orbiter is designed the way it is, with wings and all, to gain lift from the air as it lands. It's a glider. It's like a paper airplane. A very heavy paper airplane. That is not how you land on a planet with no atmosphere. You land tail down with the rocket engine running to slow your descent. Or is there nobody left on Earth who has played Lunar Lander? I get why they used it. Nothing reads Spaceship from Earth like the shuttle orbiter. Probably an even more recognizable icon for space travel than a police box. And it saves a ton of designer hours to just enlarge the look of the shuttle orbiter rather than work out another moon vehicle, especially when there's a lot of work to do designing space spiders, which they did very well. Bet you didn't know the design team of Doctor Who was subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer. By the way, at one point, the shuttle commander Lundvik and Clara are out moonwalking and they look back toward the shuttle only to see it pitch nose down and slide into a crevasse at a precarious angle. Magically, when they get back inside the shuttle, the floor is as level as any sound stage in Cardiff. More bad science. The key problem which the doctor encounters is that the moon is gaining weight. No, not weight, doctor. Mass. Mass. No, never mind that. So he takes time to explain it to the astronaut, Lundvik, who has just arrived from Earth. What? If Lundvik had not been aware of the mass of the moon, she would never have been able to plot a trajectory to get there from the Earth. Rocket science. You'd think the Brits would know that. Isaac Newton invented the rules. Moreover, if she weren't aware of the increasing mass of the moon, she wouldn't have needed to make the trip in the first place. Exposition. Always a bitch. Now, I know the doctor's explaining it for the benefit of the viewers, and cleverly illustrating it with his yo-yo, but Lundvik might have chimed in with, yes, yes, we know, that's why we're here. Unexplained, or I missed it. When did NASA start hiring British astronauts exclusively? What does a heavier moon mean to the Earth? Why should we care? The doctor says, high tide everywhere. No, that's not how tides work. The tide is high on the side of the Earth facing the moon, and the opposite side, 
Low tide in the middle. That's how tides work. High tide everywhere would require somehow that there's more total water in the ocean, rising sea levels. We don't get that from tides, we get that from global warming. I told you this was an episode for Republicans, there is no global warming. If the Earth were actually being orbited by a planet of the same mass as the Earth, I bet we'd have more than water tides to contend with. If the moon started gaining mass and we waited until its mass was a twin of the Earth before acting, we would be locking the barn door after the horses have all drowned or been swallowed up by earthquakes. On the plus side, the people doing the production budget for Doctor Who must have been relieved to read a script where the moon has Earth-level gravity. That saved them a ton of special effects money, didn't it? On to biology. The Doctor determines the reason that the moon is gaining mass is because it's alive. It's actually an egg and there's an embryonic space chick growing inside of it. Mm, well, maybe, but where does the extra weight come from? Mammals gain weight during pregnancy because mammals eat during pregnancy. Bird eggs, on the other hand, don't eat. Not while they're incubating, no. So they don't gain weight. The embryo inside the egg gains weight, but the whole system doesn't because the weight of the yolk goes down as it's absorbed by the chick embryo developing. It all balances out, almost, actually. Actually, a small amount of water is lost through evaporation because the shells are porous. So in fact, bird eggs lose weight on the journey from laying to hatching. Oh, and I have a question about designing moon bases. Why don't they ever put the light switch near the front door? Why do they always have to send someone off to the back where the monsters are to get the power on? Oh, right, <laughs> because that's where the monsters are. We want to see somebody get eaten. Kudos to the designers and effects people. The moon looked terrific. The moon spiders were as creepy as you'd want them to be. And I thought the direction by Paul Wilmshurst and the cinematography by Ashley Rowan and his crew were all first rate. While I'm dishing out praise, let's hear it for the focus pullers. It took three of them on this episode. Chris Samwith, Jonathan Vigeon, and Matthew Waving. You guys never get enough credit. Well done, all of you. Until next time, I'm Mikola. <laughs> DVD Extras, The Space Shuttle, Flashback. It's June, 1979. The 11th James Bond movie opens, Moonraker. British writer Christopher Wood has written a screenplay that shows space shuttle orbiters flying on the backs of 747 jetliners, which they do from time to time. But then they're hijacked by the villain, Drax, and they break free from the planes and fly off into orbit. Now, the folks at Rockwell International, who were building the orbiter, cooperated on the production, even allowed shooting in their Palmdale assembly plant. But when they saw the finished film, the Rockwell gang were a little upset. Why? Because the orbiter can't take off from the back of an airplane. It doesn't carry enough fuel on board to do anything but steer and fire retros to slow down and fall from orbit. James Bond has given everybody the wrong idea. Those huge main engines at the back of the orbiter can't even run unless they're fueled by an external tank. And even that isn't enough to get the damn thing into orbit. It needs two solid rocket boosters. Oh, one other thing. In 1979, the space shuttle is late. It hasn't flown. Moonraker was supposed to release in connection with the first launch, but that wasn't going to happen. So the communications office at Rockwell decided to commission an audiovisual presentation to run at the visitor center at Cape Kennedy. They wanted to tell the true story of how the shuttle works. They hired an LA production company called ImageStream to produce it, and ImageStream hired me to write it. So one day in 1980, the head of the company, Chris Carodi, and I head over to the Rockwell offices for a briefing. A wiry test pilot named B.J. Long explains his problem. People don't understand the orbiter. They keep confusing the orbiter with the shuttle. But the orbiter's just one component of the shuttle. The shuttle's the whole system. He wants us to make a little slideshow that will inform people of the truth. The orbiter does not take off into space from the back of a 747 airplane. Get that? I sat there in his office getting this briefing. And I thought for a minute and I said to him, you know, you don't, you don't need us to do this. What you actually need to do is finish building the thing, put the launch on television, and Walter Cronkite will explain it to everyone. Everyone will know how it works. Surprisingly, he didn't fire us on the spot. And that job led me to my next job with ImageStream, which was to make a show for the Apple sales conference, which, leaving out most of the intermediate steps, is what got me here today talking to you now. So the notion in Peter Harness's script that they could just pull an orbiter out of the museum and reattach the back end and fly to the moon, that's even more fanciful than a police phone box that's bigger on the inside. At least the police box can claim Gallifreyan technology. Those are my previous reviews of Doctor Who. And by the way, thank you so much for your generous and thoughtful comments. I love reading them and answering them. And here's Barry, Barry Aldrich. I haven't watched his review yet. I always put mine up before looking at his. I, then I go check out whether or not we agree. Bye now.
Oh.